Welcome to the show. Have we got a show that's on point, a hot topic for you. Today we're talking about red teaming climate change. We've got black swans, we've got grey rhinos, we've got ostrich effect, we've got a whole menagerie coming your way. And myself and the amazing Mr. Bryce Hoffman are going to talk about some of the tools and techniques that are going to help you to overcome that great phrase, willful blindness. If you don't know what that is, tune in, find out and learn lots more. Hope to hear and see from you soon. Welcome to Red Team TV, sponsored by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan and great leaders think. Each week, we bring you new ideas and insights from business leaders, military leaders, and thought leaders. Ideas and insights that will help you think more deeply and lead more effectively, so that you can better navigate your complex world. Here again are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former Royal Air Force Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Hello and welcome to the show. Marcus, it's good to see you again. It's great to see you again, my friend, even though it is through the window of Zoom. So what are we going to talk about this week? Now we're back on the sides of the Atlantic. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because there's been something I've been thinking about since I, since I left the UK, um, literally since I was sitting on the tarmac at Heathrow on July 18th, which for those who don't remember was the, the first day of the massive heat wave that hit the UK. And, and I was listening to the pilot talking about how much he hoped we were going to be able to take off before the runway melted. And, uh, you know, kind of thought he was joking until I learned that uh, the runway actually had melted at Luton Airport, uh, just north of Heathrow, shutting it down. Yeah. And it, it it got me thinking, you know, not just that, but then seeing the the fires that broke out in the, in the UK uh, over the next couple of days, the, the the transit system breaking down, the train stopping, oh, yes. all of this, I found myself asking, why why is this country so ill prepared for rising temperatures when we've been talking about global warming for decades, when the political yeah. leaders have been talking about the fact that temperatures are rising and that we're going to see heat waves like this. When literally just a few months ago, up in Scotland, you hosted a global climate summit talking yeah. about how this was going to happen. We tend to ignore things until they actually happen and then wonder why we can't deal with it when it does. And Bryce, it'll be the same again in four months when winter, uh, the barbaric <laughs> winter of the northern UK arrives and a half inch of snow falls and catches everybody unawares. People just aren't preparing for what is often the inevitable and often well advertised thing that's coming down range. Why and it isn't that? just the UK. I don't want to just no. pick on the UK. I mean, I, I live in California here and, and we've been having, you know, record fire seasons, not just California, the entire West of the Americas yeah. ha has been having <clears throat> these massive fires every year. And yet we have one super tanker, super firefighting tanker, 747, that splits its time between fighting fires in 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 you know the the north northern hemisphere summer in the US and Canada and then goes down in our winter to Australia during its summer and spends the second half of the year fighting fires there. There's one in the entire world. And yet fires are getting more intense, bigger. And this has been going on for, for, for several years. And yet there's not a single government that seems willing to say, you know what, maybe we should have two of those planes at least. So there's one for, for each hemisphere, you know, and, and I was thinking about this. I mean, you know, we build, we build a lot of military aircraft for wars that we hope we'll never have to fight, but we're unwilling to invest even in a single aircraft to fight a war that we're fighting every year against, against wildfires. And it's yeah. just one small symptom. Uh, yeah. Well, what we're talking about here is low probability, high impact, isn't it? That, that is now actually well, becoming... High no, high, I would I say it's high probability. I know, that's yeah. what I'm saying, yeah. but the, the mindset, yeah. people haven't done anything about this because all oh, those things happen so frequently that we don't have to. 
But the pace of change and that we're seeing these moving from low probability to high probability, but they're still in that same mindset, although it's not, it's not grave enough to invest in or make that big step. It's like in the UK, nobody owns air conditioning units. And then there's a mass sellout the week before when we know there's a heat wave coming, rather than being prepared and investing and certainly investing for the future, because this is only going one way. We know where this is going future-wise, and it's getting hotter, it's going to get more frequent. But again, all we hear is talk. We're not seeing the investment, the actual required change. And again, not just the West, in many countries across the globe. Absolutely. And it's not just governments. I mean, how many businesses are really prepared for the impact of, of climate change? I think it's a struggle, isn't it? There's the you know, sustainability, there's the climate control, there's the impact where people are, you know, traveling and then being highlighted in the media for using your, you know, travel budget for flying around the world and the impact you have. And there's a lot of greenwashing going on as well. We've seen companies invest in, you know, forests that happen in your neck of the woods, isn't it? People trying to use areas to say, hey, we're being green and carbon neutral where we know they're not. And it's, it's tough and it's, it's such a myriad, such a mix of behaviors in different countries across the world that it's really hard to put your finger on where the right thing that's been done is going to be the thing to follow. There's not even good practice, let alone best practice. Absolutely. And, you know, I, what you said, Marcus, about greenwashing and about doing the things, there, there's a lot of effort and, it's, and, and, and some of it is greenwashing. Some of it is, is, is legitimate and valuable and good about taking steps to reduce carbon emissions, to, to make products that are better for the environment. And that's all necessary, but that's only half of the, the problem. You also have to deal with the fact that, you know, we're on this, this, this roller coaster ride now. And even if everybody did all of those things, Temperatures are still going to increase. Correct. There's still going to be more heat waves. There's still going to be more wildfires. This is this is not something that that you're you're going to turn on a on a dime or no. on a. Um, no, what, what do people say in the UK instead of turn on a dime? Turn on a six. <laughs> turn on a sixpence. Turn, turn on a sixpence. Oh, yeah. Sixpence. Yeah. Um, you know this is this is this is like an ocean liner. And, yeah. you know, when you when you try to when you try to break an ocean liner, you have to start, you know, a long way before the dock. If you, oh. if you want to not plow into the dock. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've only really started to do the things that can slow this recently. And it's it's arguable about if we're even doing enough to do that. But yeah. my point is, is that everyone and by everyone, I mean every government, every business needs to be thinking in addition to what can we do to reduce our impact on the environment and reduce global warming. What are we going to do to deal with the fact that the, that the climate is already changing? And that's going to have big impacts for governments, as we saw in the UK recently, as we saw in, in, in all of Europe actually over the over the past uh, month month and a half of fires of of failures of public transit failures of, of electrical grids things like this because of the heat it's something that we're seeing in the US with our wildfires um, and floods just record floods that we're seeing I, I know Ken, Ken, Kentucky wasn't it the other day I saw yeah it's incredible there are things though that governments can do to prepare for these things you know that we could we could invest more in this country, for instance, as I mentioned, in, in building more firefighting aircraft, bigger, you know, the size that really can make a difference in these mega fires. You know, you you could upgrade the tarmac at Heathrow so yeah. that it's able to withstand higher temperatures. It's not rocket science. It's just a lack of could. will to do it. Could. Yeah. So that's, the, that's the key phrase, isn't it? We could and we should. But so why don't we? Why don't we? Personally, I think because the things we're talking about are huge investment. And I think, and, and this is interesting because going back to the low probability thing, you remember that the sort of term black swan event that Nico Talib talked about? And then he regretted. Nassim Talib. Nassim Talib. He, he yeah. regretted using that term because people started to use it as an excuse for not planning. And I think this is what people do. They go, I don't have to spend millions on re in the runway on my watch because I can spend that money better elsewhere. 
Because if that thing does happen, that might happen once every five years and close the runway down, I can just go, oh, it's global warming. Everybody's dealing with it. And it's a sort of whitewash excuse for not properly attacking the problem that you know is going to come. And it, and it is almost that willful blindness of knowing this is coming down range, but willfully ignoring it. And I think the whole, what was it, that Michelle Rooker then wrote about, it's not the black swan, it's the grey rhino, which is mm-hmm. highly visible, is highly impactful, yet you still choose to ignore it. And that's where the willful blindness comes in. Why do, why do people do that? That's, well, that's normalcy cool. bias is a big part of it, as we've yeah. talked about in the past. I mean, you know, it's <clears throat> scientists like uh, like Dr. Daniel Kahneman and others have proven in, in experiment after experiment that whenever there's a serious situation, whenever there's an emergency, whenever there is a crisis, approximately 70% of people will actually be unable to grasp just how serious the problem is and how serious it's likely to be. And so that leads us to not take the steps necessary to deal with the problems we're dealing with. And we see this with the pandemic too. You know, our the head of, of, of our pandemic response in the United States, uh, Dr. Fauci said, I think just a couple of days ago, uh, he told our Congress that if we could do this all over again, we would have taken much more radical steps than we would than we did. We would have closed air travel immediately. We would have quarantined people coming from outside the U.S. And when people were infected, we would have, we would have quarantined them and, and kept people from moving even interstate, perhaps to to control the outbreaks. He's saying that that if we you know looking back, we we would do this. There were plenty of experts though, and you and I have worked with some of them. Centers for yeah. Disease Control and Prevention is one of our clients. There are plenty of experts who were saying back in February of 2020 that that's what we should have done, that that's what we should be doing. And they were shot down. They were batted aside. People said, oh, it's not, it's not, it doesn't require that level of of response. If we'd done those things, the pandemic would likely be over by now. Yeah, exactly. It's it's taking that responsible, responsive action when everything's telling you not to do, but you know you should. Uh, I think in a lot of these situations, we see that. And as you talked about the normalcy bias of, how bad can it get? I think people need to be more imaginative. Well, you don't you don't even have to be more imaginative. Just look at history. You can see how bad these things get. And it goes back to as simple as, you know, I was joking the other about, you know, people not replacing their batteries in their fire alarm in the house and the smoke sensors. And then, you know, a neighbor's house burns down and people wonder why. That's how bad it can get. Hopefully you get out. But, you know, just simple things that you can do to prevent these things becoming ultimately, you know, life ending if you don't or certainly house destroying but it, it's this human mind this is psyche of ours isn't it that kicks in and convinces us otherwise that it won't get that bad don't waste your time and effort and money on that well that's part of it and the other part that you touched on a few minutes ago marcus is is kicking the can down the road saying you know it's so, someone else will deal with this i'll be gone by you then know. i'll be off on my yeah. yacht yeah and we see this in business all the time. We see businesses dealing with major issues, major systemic problems where the CEO or other members of senior leadership will say, you know what, I just need to get, I, I've got three more years here before I retire. I just need to keep hitting my quarterly targets, keep Wall Street happy, keep the investors happy, and I'm good. And someone else can deal with the problem when I'm done. It's the rare leader. It's the rare leader that's willing to actually take the bull by the horns and f- and address big, hairy problems. Because there's risk involved in that. Personal, because there's risk involved. Personal right. risk. And as you said, it takes, a, it takes a great leader to do that. It takes courage, especially when you're stepping into the sort of unknowns, but they're not unknown anymore. This is the thing. There's enough data and evidence now that you can make that call confidently with the data, with the historical evidence, and do something about it or at least try to. And I, I joked about this as you're talking about, you know, executives knowing this. I, I briefed a large food and clothing company a few years ago, and I said, you are all on now the, the HMS Titanic. I said, you all know that out there is the iceberg with your name on it. What you're all edging your bets on is that it's not going to get hit in the time before you retire. And the room felt, they just sat there going, yep, yeah, you've called us out. 
You know, that's exactly what it was because, as you said it, you know, is it going to happen on my watch? Can we get away with this before I escape, before impact? And, and that's no longer, I think, in the VUCA world where we're seeing, you know, the, the speed of which change is hitting us now, the events happening on a daily basis globally that have immediate impact across the globe. You can't do that anymore. That iceberg is popping up daily. It's like whack-a-mole, isn't it? Something around the corner, whack comes up again the next day in a different guise. And therefore, I think now is ultimately leaders today have to take accountability and do something about it. You can't just nod and go, oh, yeah, yes, like we saw in Glasgow with a big, big group flying in there in the private jets talking about climate change, but then nothing actually happens. You've got to invest and you've got to encourage people to do the same. And you don't do that again by being seen not to do it. That doesn't form the right behaviors. And it's not just doing something to stop it. You also have to take the steps to deal with the challenges that it's already creating. Let's take a break. And when we come back, let's talk about how you can do that as a leader. Are you a red team thinker? Are you the person in the room who is always asking the tough questions? Do you see what others don't? Do you find yourself muttering, I told you so, too often after plans have gone awry because nobody listened to your good idea? If so, then you might be. Take our free assessment and find out. There's a link to it in the notes below. I can't wait to see how you score. Welcome back. So we've talked about the problem. We've talked about the problem of not dealing with hard situations with big challenges like climate change and the impact that they're having on us as individuals and organizations. And we've talked about willful blindness, the the tendency of some organizations, of some leaders to, to actively ignore the problems they know are coming. We've talked about the lack of long term thinking and we've talked about normalcy bias and the tendency that that most people have to minimize the significance, the seriousness of risks that they're dealing with. So what can we do about that, Marcus? What are some things that leaders and organizations can do to take the blinders off, to deal with the situation as it actually is, and to, to understand what the impacts of these challenges are likely to be for them and come up with plans for dealing with them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's lots they can do at different levels. And for me, the first thing is creating awareness and recognition of the problem. And, you know, it goes back to the ostrich effect and normalcy bias. If you know about the problem, it's a lot easier to accept it and recognize it if you can physically, collectively use tools and techniques to surface that problem as a group. And once you do that as a group, it's no longer on you alone. It's that ownership that's shared. It's a recognition that we're all facing this together. And then, yes, you may be accountable for doing something about that, but that's so much easier to do when everybody's aware. You get that group buy-in rather than the group think that, wow, this is this is really a problem. We should do something about this. And, you know, the tools and techniques that we, we talk a lot about, we do use the six strategic questions. You know, what is the problem? we're trying to solve that question one, one of the most powerful questions that you can ask yourself, ask your teams, ask each other. And once you accept and realize what that problem actually is, what do you then do about it? And rather than put your head in the sand or you know, it'll never happen, don't really, let's just go and do something else. You can then start to look at other different tools and techniques. And I know one of your favorites, and uh, one of our favorite gentlemen, Dr. Gary Klein, he came yeah, up with pre-mortem, pre-mortem analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Pre-mortem analysis is something that everybody should be doing right now. In, and that is looking at your plans, looking at your strategies and saying, if this fails, how is it going to fail? Because when you do that, when you look at how your plans could fail, and I don't mean like missing your target by 2%. I mean, Imagine that there is a catastrophic failure and imagine that it's caused, for instance, by climate change. You could say, if climate change is going to have a negative impact on our business strategy, on our 
on our plans, on our transportation system, on our runways. What is that going to look like? And, 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 and just ask that of your team to, to look into their crystal balls and imagine a worst case scenario. And then once they've done that, ask what are the things that we could do right now to make sure that doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. There's another tool, though, too, that I think that, that is also worth considering this, and that's alternative futures analysis. This is, a, this is another tool that we teach that's very powerful. It's similar to scenario planning, but it's different because it looks at the levers that you can pull as an organization to try to steer the future in the desired direction. And, you know, one of the things you could do is do an alternative futures analysis looking at what, what is the impact on our plan, on our strategy, on our infrastructure, whatever it is, in a world in which climate change is controlled versus in a world in which climate change continues to get worse yeah. year after year and problems that it causes continue to magnify. Absolutely. Uh, three simple tools there. The other one we talk about, and you like to ask the question, why, a lot. One of my favorite questions is, what if? So what if this happens? And again, when you start to question and ask those what ifs and start to realize what does happen, then the dominoes start to fall. What are those consequences? First, second, third, because when something happens, we all sort swan of focus dive. on the first order effect, the swan dive. Absolutely. One That's of my true. favorite yeah. tools. Because a thing happens and we go, oh, this will happen. First order effect. What about the other 55 things that might happen, second, third, fourth, fifth, and the cascade from that one event? And I think that's such a powerful thing because once you see the impact of a single event, both good and bad, you know, we often see the threats and the negatives, but also within that, there are many opportunities, as we saw with COVID, where organizations who looked beyond the darkness and saw these opportunities floating by captured them. But then also, if you're looking forward, you can start to then look backwards from the point of impact. How did that happen? What caused it moving into pre-mortem territory? What are the things that led up to that? And how close are we to those happening? What are the, you know, the indicators and the signposts of failure coming our way? And again, all of these tools that we're talking about are just collective capabilities. You can use them individually. You can use parts of them and they are flexible that allow you to respond to the scenarios you're facing into. And we, as we talk about these change daily, what we plan and talk about today, when we all come back tomorrow, something may have changed. And that's okay. You've got to have these iterative, iterative decision-making capabilities that allow you to be humble enough to realize that things are changing and have the capability and the team members in the mindset and the frame of mind to accept it and then apply the tools as you require. Right. And, you know, it's interesting because if you look at Swan Dive, for instance, I developed this tool for a client that wanted to look at what might happen, what would be the impact, positive and negative, if one of their competitors, of two, sorry, if two of their competitors merged. And, and I took a tool that, that had been developed by the military and the intelligence community that I'd learned uh, at, the, at the Army's uh, Red Teaming University called high impact, low probability analysis. And I modified it and, and created what we now call Swan Dive to look at, let's assume this, this event happens. And then, as you said, topple the dominoes that come from that. And then also work backwards to see what are the things that would have led to this. And in doing that, we found that there were a lot of opportunities in this that they had missed. It wasn't just a negative event. It also created certain opportunities. I can't go into what those were because, you know, it, it was it would, it would kind of give give it away a bit. But my point is is that you you could do the exact same thing with climate change. You could say, let's assume that over the next five years, you know, the 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 average summer temperature in the UK is going to increase, you know, X percent, and that we're going to have X number of days of 100 degree temperatures or what, what, sorry, I don't do Celsius. Well. <laughs> so, 
Uh, 30 40, degrees Celsius? 40 plus was the threat this 40 time. 40 plus. Okay, 40, 40 plus degrees Celsius. And then say, okay, so, so when that happens, what's the impact going to be? What are the, going to be the immediate results of that? And then what's going to happen as a result of those things? If you do that, I mean, we're simplifying it. The, 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 the way we actually do this tool is, is, is more involved than that. But if you simply just do that as a mental exercise, it will really help you prepare. It will help you understand the challenges that you're facing and be better equipped to deal with them if you take those in if you take what you learn from that mental exercise and modify your plans accordingly absolutely and and I, and I think as well as that builds your situational awareness of what's likely to come ahead you start to develop self awareness of your real understanding and appreciation of the problem and you start to see the awareness of others and you instill that awareness across your organization and you start to see the willingness of people to accept to appreciate and then commit, are we going to spend X amount of our budget next year on going after this? Forget next year, today. Are we going to change the CFO's mind about where we invest? Because collectively now we all know there's a problem. We've seen it. We've surfaced these things ourselves. And what we don't want to be sat here in a year going, we told you so. Because there's no worse position to be in, however grand you might think you are because you were clever and you saw it. The consequences of being right doesn't bear thinking about in some of the situations of the thinking. Well, you know, that's an interesting point because, you know, one of the unfortunate things that we see is that when organizations do the right thing, they often get criticized for it. Um, you know, and I'll give you an example. I think that, I think it, that Heathrow asking airlines to suspend ticket sales this summer was a brilliant move. It was the right thing to do. I know it's very controversial. I know it's upset a lot of people. But the reality is, is people would have been more upset if they were sitting in terminal one or two or three or four, you know, watching the boards flicker, canceled, 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 or, you know, uh, you know, stranded overseas because they couldn't get back to the UK. Uh, and so yeah. it takes a certain amount of courage to, to yeah. proactively do. I'm going to come straight here yeah, now. No, no, yeah, okay. you, no. It was the right thing to do to make the best of a bad situation, which they had. Yeah, created. I'm not saying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the right thing to do would have been a swan dive during the pandemic to say, "What if we fire all of our staff? What if we don't have that option?" And that's where I think you got the frustration by the airlines because they saw this coming and nobody did anything about it. Same situation we're talking about with climate change. So it's fascinating isn't it, to see how these, these events are so replicable regarding climate change, regarding business behaviors, regarding people's response to things as they occur. And they witness them and obviously the media come in and frenzy, you know, turn everything into a fuel frenzy. And we see the outcome from that as well. So this, all of the things you're talking about and we've been discussing, it's just allowing people to slow down, look ahead, think, pause for thought and what can we do different today to try and prevent this happening tomorrow or next year. And sometimes people get it right. I want to, you know, credit where credit is due. You know, I, I, w I, was, I was thinking as I was flying over the Thames and past the, what, the, the, the flood barriers yeah. uh, on the Thames, that's red team thinking in action. Yeah, you mentioned Somebody it. Somebody looked at the situation. I told you, you at the time. Yeah, we were said, flying back from Edinburgh. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, that's red team thinking in action. Somebody sat and looked and said, right, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It may not even happen 10 years from yeah. now. But the way things are going, we are going to get a storm surge come up the Thames. It's going to devastate London. Yeah. And so let's let's do the heavy lifting now of building that very impressive system. Yeah. Not because it's going to happen tomorrow, but because it's going to happen someday. Yeah. And then when it does, and I'm sure that was politically a hard thing to do, to spend the tax money required to, oh, to do that. Absolutely. I'm sure there were a lot of people saying, oh, why are, you know, London's high and dry right now. Why are we wasting money on this? But those same people 
would have been the first ones in line pillaring politicians when they were standing knee deep in water saying, why didn't you do something about this? Exactly. And I think that's the thing now, isn't it? You know, listeners today go away into your organizations and ask that question. What is it that we could do today, tomorrow, as a collective group to really consider what might happen and what is actually quite likely to happen? And as Bryce just said, then it might not be tomorrow, but downrange, and whether you're still there or not, whether you've stepped off that Titanic and sailed off on another yacht, that's your call. But I think we've all got a moral responsibility now. Well, we always have, but you know, certainly some less or more than others. But I think now as, as, a, as a group of people living on this planet, I think we all have to take accountability of where we're going and how we're influencing that future journey. And if you as a small group can make a difference in your organization, then why wouldn't you do that? And there's some tools, techniques that you can take away, certainly and help along that journey going forward. Well said, Marcus. On that very strong piece of advice, thank you all for tuning in. See you next week. Great seeing you all. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to Red Team TV, sponsored by Red Team Thinking. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and notification icon below so you don't miss the next idea-filled episode. If you prefer to listen on the go, subscribe to Bryce and Marcus's podcast, The Thinking Leader, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. And don't forget to visit redteamthinking.com to learn more about Red Team Thinking work and Marcus and Bryce's upcoming online courses. While you're there, take our free quiz to find out how you rate as a Red Team Thinker and if your organization has a Red Team culture. Because who thinks wins?